In this video, we will introduce the restricted Boltzmann machine. The restricted Boltzmann machine is a neural network which belongs to the class of probabilistic graphical models. These neural networks are very different from conventional neural networks in that they work from using discrete sampling from states with probabilistic dependencies among them. Most of the neural net architectures that we have seen so far map inputs to outputs. Such methods are ideal for supervised models in which outputs are used in order to learn the relationships to the inputs. However, these architectures can also be used for unsupervised models by replicating the output. And one example of such an architecture which we have seen in previous lectures is the autoencoder. Restricted Boltzmann machines are a fundamentally different class of models. They are borrowed from the notion of probabilistic graphical models. In these models, we have a graph of probabilistic dependencies between binary states that are outcomes of distributions. I will emphasize the fact that most of the work on restricted Boltzmann machine uses binary states, which means that the states are drawn from 0 or 1. And they're typically drawn from a probabilistic distribution over binary states. Uh, in this case, uh, the training data is also binary in nature, and the binary training data provides examples of states. These techniques are ideal for unsupervised models. Now, there are some fundamental differences uh, of the restricted Boltzmann machine from conventional neural networks. In a conventional neural network, we have an input to output mapping. However, in a restricted Boltzmann machine, we do not have this notion of input to output mapping. Rather, the states are discrete samples of probability distributions with interdependencies among the different states. So what it means is that there is a graph of dependencies among the states and these dependencies are probabilistic in nature. And we will see the precise nature of the probabilistic dependency later. And all the states are drawn as discrete samples from these states which satisfy these interdependencies. Now, the training data typically provides examples of some of these states and these set of states which, uh, for which examples are provided are referred to as visible because they are visible to the end user. Now, we, in the restricted Boltzmann machine, we do have a computational graph abstraction like a, a conventional neural network. So in a restricted Boltzmann machine, as we mentioned, you have these graph of dependencies among states and the parameterized edges, the weights on those edges define the nature of these dependencies. And the use of the computational graph abstraction is its main commonality with conventional neural networks. And as we will see later, this similarity with conventional neural networks can be exploited for pre-training of conventional neural networks. So the idea here for pre-training is that one can approximately convert a sampling-based dependency to a real-valued operation for initialization of a related con conventional neural network. So even though restricted Boltzmann machines are fundamentally different from conventional neural networks, they, they are used for initialization of conventional neural networks. And this is one of their uses which gave a lot of uh, prominence to the, uh, to the area of restricted Boltzmann machines. And in fact, the whole idea of pre-training started with the use of restricted Boltzmann machines. So th this is essentially the historical significance of the restricted Boltzmann machine. Uh, that is that most of the practical applications uh, in neural networks, they use supervised learnings. <clears throat> However, RBMs uh, are typically unsupervised models, but they can still be used for unsupervised pre-training of conventional neural networks. And also with some modifications, they can be extended to supervised learning. So in order to uh, use the output of an RBM, uh, a trained RBM uh, for, uh, for a conventional neural network, for initialization of a conventional neural network, what is typically done is that the binary state, each binary state is replaced with its probability of being one.
and these fractional values are treated as the activations of a conventional neural net network as we'll see the probability distributions of a restricted boltzmann machine they use the sigmoid function so in fact these sigmoid based probability distributions can be replaced by sigmoid activations in a conventional neural network so one can in fact use a trained Boltzmann machine in order to initialize a, a conventional neural network and pre-training owes its historical origins to RBMs. So let's see how a restricted Boltzmann machine is defined. In a restricted Boltzmann machine, we have two sets of states, two types of states. We have the hidden states and we have the visible states. And the hidden states and the visible states, they form a bipartite graph among them. Now note that in a general Boltzmann machine, which I've discussed in the book, we do allow edges between all states. However, in a restricted Boltzmann machine, when you use the word restricted, it refers to the fact that edges are only allowed between the hidden states and the visible states. <clears throat> so these edges essentially, they define the correlations between the hidden states and the visible states. So for example, when a weight of an edge is strongly positive, so for example, let's say the weight of the edge between H1 and V1 is strongly positive, then typically what it would mean is that H1 and V1 are more likely to be on together. On the other hand, if the weight between H1 and V1 is very strongly negative, it means that H1 and V1 are more likely to take on different binary values. So if one is a one, the other will be a zero and vice versa. So this kind of uh, model can be used uh, in order to uh, create uh, this, uh, in, 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 in order to create unsupervised models for binary data. So let's look at a specific example. Let's look at an interpretable Boltzmann machine to give a feel of how a Boltzmann machine models data. So let's say that uh, you have uh, a Boltzmann machine with three hidden uh, states and four visible states. The fact that you have four visible states, it means that your training data has dimensionality four uh, and all of those values are zeros or ones. So in this case, let's say that your training data corresponds to uh, the distribution of the types of ice creams that the child sees every day, that the child's parents bring every day uh, to the child. And uh, any of these four bits can be one uh, at, at any given point. And uh, what is hidden from the child is how the parents procure these ice creams. So these ice creams, the parents go to one of three hidden trucks, which is not visible to the child. That's Ben's truck, Jerry's truck, and Tom's truck, and buy the ice creams from one of these trucks. Now the weights between the uh, different trucks and the different types of ice cream, it, it defines the fact the parents are more likely to buy different items from different trucks. So that fact is encoded in the weights. And there may be a variety of reasons for it, uh, for that. One truck may, may, may keep certain types of ice cream or, 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 or uh, one type of ice cream may be less expensive than a particular type of truck. But the main point here is that this is an undirected model. What it means is that the parents' probability to, uh, to buy particular types of ice creams depends on which trucks they pick. Similarly, which trucks they pick also depend on which types of ice creams they want to buy. So in a sense, there is a circular dependency because it's an undirected uh, uh, it is an undirected mo model. There's a circular probabilistic dependency between the types of trucks that the parents pick and the type of ice creams that the, finally the child sees. So the child, all that the child sees is, uh, is the visible states. That means every day that the child receives a training point which contains four bits, which corresponds to which ice creams are received by a child. Now, the child only knows the fact that uh, there are three trucks from which the parents buy the ice cream. But the child has no idea of uh, what the parent's model is to, uh, to buy ice creams from these trucks or what the weights between the trucks and the ice creams are. However, what the child might notice is that there might be correlations between the bits that the child actually sees. So, for example, the child might notice that whenever she gets a cone, she also gets a sundae. And uh, but she doesn't get a popsicle and the child might also notice that whenever she gets a popsicle, she gets a cup, but she doesn't get a sundae. 
So what it might mean is that perhaps the cones and the sundae might be coming from one truck and the popsicle and the cup uh, might be coming from another truck. So the child can use uh, uh, the training data. So if the, if, the, if the child has enough number of training points that the child can use these visible states from the daily, tra daily training data to model the weights between the trucks and the ice creams. And that is the essence of what is done in a Boltzmann machine. And once, once the child has these weights, these learned weights can be used by the child to generate samples of what the training data look like. So, so, so once the child learns the weights, they can use it as a generative model in order to generate many examples of typical sets of ice creams that they are likely to have, which, uh, which makes sense. So for example, in those generated training data also, the similar distribution will be seen. So for example, cones and sundays will, will come together and popsicle and cup will come together. So this is just one example of a generative model. So let's look at the kind of model that a restricted Boltzmann machine builds. A restricted Boltzmann machine it, uh, builds probability distributions of the binary. So all states are binary here. Uh, here also note that in, in this example of the trucks and the ice creams, all states are binary. Either a truck is picked or not picked. Either an ice cream is picked or not picked. Bet between the binary hidden and visible states which depend on each other. And the weights on the edges, they control probabilistic dependency. So at a qualitative level, if the weight between a truck and a particular type of ice cream has a large positive value, then those are more likely to be on together. On the other hand, if the weight is negative, they are, those binary values are more likely to be different. And the training data are assumed to be samples of visible states. So in this application over here, the only visible states are the cone, sundae, popsicle and cup. That's all the child will see, uh, which uh, four bits, but they will not see the three bits uh, corresponding to which truck was picked. And uh, in a sense, given a lot of training data, given examples, a lot of examples of these four bits, the cone, sundae, popsicle and cup, what we want to do is that we want to learn weights that are consistent with the training sample. And the way in which this consistency is enforced is with the use of an energy function. So this is in essence an unsupervised model. And once the weights have been learned, they can be used to output samples that are consistent with the training data. So this is a generative model. So now let us uh, introduce some notations and definitions. So we assume that uh, the binary hidden units are denoted by H1 through HM. So M is a number of hidden units. So in this example, M is three because you have three types of trucks, which are the hidden states. And uh, the uh, visible states are denoted by V1 through VD. Now D is the dimensionality of your training data. It's also equal to the number of visible states. So in this case, your visible states correspond to the different types of ice creams and uh, here you have four visible states uh, because your dimensionality is four. Now the bias associated with the visible node i, vi, is noted by bvi. Now what is the bias? In a sense, what the bias tells you is independent of what the probabilistic dependency is for, uh, of a cone to a truck, there is uh, an inherent bias towards turning, uh, picking a particular ice cream. So for example, cones are more likely to be bought. So that will have a high bias. Or if cones is less likely to be bought, uh, th th that means that the bias will be negative. So here you have these types of bias variables for the visible states and we also have bias variables for the hidden states. So the bias variable for a hidden, hidden state tells you the inherent propensity to pick a particular truck independent of the probabilistic dependencies. So the weight of the edge between the visible node VI and the hidden state EdgeJ is noted by WIJ. So in a sense, this tells you something about the correlation between the visible state I and the hidden state EdgeJ. Now note that all of this, uh, all of what we discuss in this lecture uses binary states because most of Boltzmann machines and restricted Boltzmann machines, they work with binary states. However, with some work, uh, the approach can also be generalized to non-binary data and that is discussed in the book. 
So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the hidden states and the probably uh, uh, and the visible states that depend on one another. So, what are these dependencies? These dependencies they use the weight function. They they use the weights between the edges. So, in a sense, what one is doing, the probability that the hidden state is one is given by one plus one. This is a sigmoid function. Sigmoid function minus b j h minus i is equal to 1 to do vi wij. Now note that this value in the brackets, uh, the, the part within the exponent, this is essentially a linear transformation, which is similar to what you use in a conventional neural network. So in a sense, what you're doing is that you're applying a linear transformation, then you're applying a sigmoid activation, except that now you're using a sigmoid activation to sample. In a conventional neural network, you use a sigmoid uh, activation to set a fractional value here that's the main difference the, uh, so there are two differences one is that the the, the, the dependency is both ways the hidden states and the binary states uh, the hidden states and the visible states they depend on one another in a conventional neural network the dependency is only one way there are there, there are forward operations here they depend on one another but the nature of these activations they are very similar the nature of this operation is, is it's, it's essentially a sigmoid uh, and a linear operation combined except that we are now sampling from that probability <clears throat> and now what you want to do is that you want to learn the weights wij so that the samples of your training data are most con consistent with these relationships so in a sense these relationships what they tell you is that once the parents have made up their mind what the visible states are what the hidden states should be and once they know what the hidden states should be what the visible states they should pick so there is a circular dependency which is what makes the training uh, a bit more difficult as we'll see there is a notion of uh, gibbs sampling a notion of thermal equilibrium which is required in order to uh, identify samples which satisfy this type of circular relationship so, uh, so 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 in order for these samples to be as consistent as possible we use an objective function the, 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 and, and that objective function is an energy function which tries to force consistency by minimizing the expected value of E. Now note that all of these VIs, HJs, VI and HJ, they are all random variables. So what you're trying to do, you're trying to learn weights which will minimize the expected value of this expression over here because this is a random expression. Now, one point that you'll notice in this energy function, uh, you have this WIJ, then VI multiplied by HJ. Note that if WIJ is highly positive, then this energy function will be minimized. It will be highly negative only when VI and HJ tend to take on the same values, which is consistent with, with what I discussed earlier, that high weights imply higher correlations among the corresponding states. So, uh, before we discuss, we, we get into the training process of a Boltzmann machine, which is uh, learning the weights. Let's say that you have already learned the weights of a Boltzmann machine. So one question arises is that, let's say that you have somehow learned the weights of a Boltzmann machine. How would you generate data from the Boltzmann machine? The data is generated by using Gibbs sampling. The idea is that in Gibbs sampling is that you first you randomly initialize the visible states and then you sample the hidden states using equation one, which is in the previous slide. So in a sense, so let's say in this example over here, let's say you, you, you randomly initialize cones and Sunday to one and popsicle and cup to zero. And then what you do is that you use equation one over here because now you have some sampled values of vi so you can evaluate the right hand side you you have already trained your model so you know what the wijs are you know what the bias is and you have a random initialization for vi you you can calculate a probability for each hidden state its probability being one then you'll sample from these hidden states so now you'll get a sample of the hidden states now what you will do, once you have a sample of the hidden states, you will use equation 2 to get another sample of the visible states. So in a sense, what you do is that you alternately sample the hidden states and the visible states from one another using equations 1 and 2 until thermal equilibrium is reached. So thermal equilibrium essentially means that you... Theoretically, you have to do it for an infinite number of iterations, but in practice, doing it for a large number of iterations is good enough. 
and uh, uh, at thermal equilibrium a particular set of visible states at thermal equilibrium provides a sample of the binary training vector so so here in our example over here so let's say our child somehow modeled the weights and then after modeling the weights the child used this gibbs sampling in order to generate a sample of what uh, her ice creams would look like on the next day. So that gives her one sample of a four dimensional point which is typical of the kind of ice creams that she receives every day. Now note that if she wants to get her next sample, she can't just use one more iteration. She has to repeat this entire GIF sampling again for a large number of iterations in order to generate the next sample. So as you can see, generating samples uh, with this type of approach can be very expensive because in a sense each time you're generating a visible state you have to use Gibbs sampling and the weights in a sense they implicitly encode the distribution by defining the probabilistic dependencies between uh, the hidden states and the visible states now what is the intuition for the weights so the, so the weights are like affinity. So large positive values of Wij imply that the states will be on together. So we, uh, if, although the hidden states are not visible to the end user, one does have samples showing which visible states are on together. So the child does get to see which ice creams always tend, up, tend to show up together. So for example, if uh, a cone and a sundae always show up together, a popsicle and a cup show up together, it's a good bet that, that probably the cone and the sundae come from one truck and the popsicle and the cup come from another truck. In practice, it will probably be some more complicated distribution where you'll have all kinds of correlations between the four types of ice creams. But given enough training data, one can learn the weights of uh, the, the visible states to the hidden states. The, the weights will be learned in such a way that the hidden states will be connected to correlated uh, visible, uh, visible states with large weights. And uh, the, the way the training process works, it has a certain biological motivation. So in heavy learning, a synapse between two neurons is strengthened when the neurons on either side of the synapse have highly correlated outputs. And this is the, essentially the approach that we will use. And the, the way this will be done is by using what is called the contrastive divergence algorithm, which learns the weights for the Boltzmann machine. So let's look at an overview of the contrastive divergence algorithm. Here I will just uh, discuss a very brief overview of this algorithm. And if you want a more detailed uh, discussion of this algorithm, it is discussed in the book. So it, it has two phases which are continuous, which, 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 which are continually run simultaneously. So in the positive phase, what you do is that you draw B instances of hidden states based on visible states fixed to each of a mini batch of B training points. So what is meant by this? So let's say B is five. So what the child does is that she takes five days training data. So she will have five sets of ice creams for five days. So five days she has four bits for each of these days. And for each of these days, what she'll do is that she will use uh, equation one in order to generate hidden samples. So she will calculate the probabilities of the hidden states uh, and that will give her hidden samples. So what kind of truck uh, the ice cream came from for, for, for each of these days. Now, this will give her one, uh, uh, five sets of hidden states. So for each of the day where she has uh, a set of ice creams, she also has a candidate set of trucks, ones and zeros, uh, a three bit hidden uh, vector. Now, in a sense, what the child is going to do is for the weight WIJ, for the weight, so, so, so let's say between Ben's truck and the cup, she is going to take the average uh, product of VI and HJ. So that essentially gives her the correlation between the uh, those two particular types of ice cream and truck. So that is given by VIJ pause, uh, VI HJ pause, which is meant by positive. Now, 
uh, this is uh, now no, note that the hidden states they will not be random they will highly depend on the type of training data that was picked because the hidden states note that we picked the hidden states using this equation one over here so depending on what the visible states were and as we know there are correlations among the visible states you will get particular types of hidden states however then what you can do is that in the negative uh, phase for each of these B instances, we will continue to alternately sample visible and hidden states from one another for R iteration. Theoretically, you should use R to be a very large number, but as we'll say, see in practice, you don't need R to be large because uh, that is, and that is based on the notion of contrastive di divergence. So that will give you more of the kind of based on the current weights, it will tell you what the correlations are between VI and HJ based on what the weights currently are. So the first set VI HJ tells you based on what the training data is, what the correlation between VI and HJ are because the HJ is highly dependent on the VIs the, because we use only one iteration. However, negative phase because we continue to alternately alt, alternatively sample what we started off, the visible state we started off doesn't matter as much and in a sense you are going to get a correlation between this visible state and the hidden state that depends more on the weights rather than your, on your specific training sample. And in heavy learning, what you do is that you, you update the weights, these WIJs, by this expression over here, which is the correlation in the positive minus the correlation for the negative, and this alpha is your learning rate. Now, note that here you're training the biases too. However, in the case of biases, that is in a sense, essential, uh, that, that is in a sense equivalent to holding the corresponding hidden state to one or holding the corresponding visible state to one. So the bias updates are actually very similar to the weight updates, except that we are holding either the hidden state to one or we are holding the corresponding visible state to one. So let's just focus on the weight based update. <clears throat> in the weight based update, in essence, if you look at the definition of heavy learning, a synapse between two neurons is strengthened when the neurons on either sides side of the synapse have highly correlated output. So as you can see, when you use it uh, for only one iteration of, of the training data, you, there will be certain visible states and the hidden states will be highly correlated to one another. So for example, if the child always picks certain visible states, states, then certain hidden states are more likely to be picked. And in those cases, what is going to happen is that particular weights will be strengthened based on the notion of heavier learning. And this type of positive and phase and negative phase will repeat for many iterations until convergence. Now, uh, some remarks on co uh, contrastive divergence. Here I note that in the negative phase, uh, we only do, the, do this for R iterations. So strictly speaking, the negative phase uh, needs a very large number of iterations to reach thermal equilibrium but and the positive phase of course requires only one iteration because the visible states are fixed to the training points and we, you can just sample the hidden states straight up from these training points now uh, what contrastive divergence says uh, is that you don't need to sample it for a large number of training points only a small number of iteration of the negative phase are sufficient for a good update of the weight vector so uh, this is similar to the principle of stochastic gradient de descent where using even though theoretically you should use a very large number of iteration in practice even if you use a small number of iterations the divergence of the correlations by using a small number of iteration is sufficient that the weight is updated in the correct direction so at least in the early phases of, of the training when the weights are very incorrect even one additional iteration is sufficient for a good update however in the later phases when the weights become more refined one can increase the number of iterations so uh, there is a, a, a lot of utility of uh, this type of uh, unsuper uh, uh, unsupervised learning. One utility is that one can use an RBM to, init uh, to initialize an autoencoder for uh, binary data. And we will discuss this in later slides. Uh, so, and what you will essentially have to do is that you will be using the, the sigmoid based sampling. So note that in your restricted Boltzmann machine, you are doing sigmoid based sampling. You will treat it as a real valued sigmoid activation as in a conventional neural network. And 
this basic idea can be extended to multi-layer neural networks by using stacked RBMs. And this was, in a sense, the earliest methods of pre and this is how pre really got started. So, let's first look at this undirected model and let's look at uh, the equivalence between undirected and directed models. Now, if you look at the undirected relationship between the uh, hidden states and the visible states. Now note the, that these equations uh, 1 and 2 which I had mentioned in an earlier slide. This, this equation 1 and 2, this is essentially a sigmoid function applied to a weight vector. But, but one point that you will notice uh, within the exponent of equation 1, you have summation i is equal to 1 to do vi wij and within the exponent of equation 2, you have sigma j is equal to 1 to n, uh, j is equal to 1 to m, at j wij. So you'll notice that there is some asymmetry in the two cases in terms of how the visible and hidden states are, are, are being treated. That is because you are using the transpose of the weight matrix uh, in, the, in one of the two cases. So you can in fact write it in this way, that the sampling, that equation 1 and 2 which I showed you in the previous slide, that can be written in this form <coughs> over here in the shortened form over here note that in, in in one case you are using w in our case you're using w transpose so you can in a sense write it as a directed model where the hidden states are are obtained from the visible states using w and the visible states are op obtained from the hidden states using w transpose now uh, with this equivalence now that you have a directed model it's a little bit easier in order to Create, uh, so let's say that you have a trained restricted Boltzmann machine. How can I create a conventional neural network so that it's real valued activations? So if you replace the weights uh, in the restricted Boltzmann machine with the, with the weights in your conventional neural network, that conventional neural network will show good accuracy for unsupervised learning. How, 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 how can we perform this transformation? And that I have shown here how you can use a trained RBM to initialize a conventional autoencoder. So let's say that you have this restricted Boltzmann machine that you trained. So you have these visible states, you have these hidden states, these are all trained using discrete sampling. However, uh, you can now create a conventional neural network with three layers. So what you do, you unfurl this circular dependency between the hidden and visible states into three states. So you have the visible states, which are fixed. These are fixed to your training data points, which is what you show the model. This is an input to your conventional neural network. Then it goes to the hidden states, which are your reduced features. And then uh, you, your visible states, th then you apply W transfer. This is your reconstructed features. Now, the other point is that in your restricted Boltzmann machine, you are always using discrete sampling. So here you can see equations one and two, this is discrete sampling. You can see the, this is a sampling operation uh, that, that I've shown over here. You replace this discrete sampling with equality. So you can see that equations three and four are no longer sampling operation. It is edge j bar is equal to. That means that the hidden states and visible states are now real values. So all the operations now are real valued operations. So if you train a restricted Boltzmann machine with this set of weights and you create a conventional neural network with this derived set of weights from the restricted Boltzmann machine, you can show that reasonably good accuracy can be achieved on this conventional neural network. And this is how the idea of pre-training, this is how you can use a completely different class of neural networks, a restricted Boltzmann machine, which is so different from conventional neural networks, to initialize a conventional neural network in which the nature of the operations are so different. So one question that arises is, well, an RBM is seems like a very computationally intensive way to train. Even sampling uh, a training point from an RBM requires GIP sampling, which seems to be so expensive. Why would one want to use an RBM to initialize a conventional neural network? One of the reasons for this is that in the earlier years, conventional neural networks did not train very well, especially with increased depth. depth. Now we have many more tricks, so one can do much better. So we have batch normalization uh, and pre-training has been extended to conventional networks. So it is not so much of a problem anymore. But in the earlier years, the vanishing and exploding gradient problems were huge uh, uh, challenges for training conventional neural networks. And in these cases, because an RBM trains with the contrastive divergence algorithm, there was no vanishing and exploding gradient problem. So this approach was seen as a shortcut 
to training deep neural networks, especially if you can use stacked RBMs to initialize deep networks. So far, we have only shown the case of initialization of a simple autoencoder. This is the simplest form of an autoencoder I have shown here on the right, where you just have a single hidden layer. But you can also apply this trick with stacked RBMs to initialize deep networks. And, and so the approach was generalized to conventional autoencoders later. So how does this work? So what is a stacked RBM? So a stacked RBM here is you have a set of hidden states and visible states. So uh, one set of hidden states and visible states on the left, I have shown it as a rectangle. So what do you do? You train one RBM uh, like you would train any pair of hidden and visible states. That, then whatever the uh, hidden state values are, you copy it to the next RBM, to RBM2, and then you train sequentially train the next RBM2, and then you again copy uh, the, uh, the hidden states of the next RBM to the to RBM3, to the visible states of RBM3, and then you again train RBM3. So in a sense, this is what you call layer-wise pre-training. In an earlier lecture, I had discussed layer-wise pre-training with autoencoders. And in fact, that idea of layer-wise pre-training, it was inherited from this idea in the case of the restricted Boltzmann machine. Because in the restricted Boltzmann machine, it's very natural to do layer-wise pre-training because typically the Boltzmann machine, the restricted Boltzmann machine is trained in layer-wise fashion where you train one set of hidden and visible layer together. Uh, and, and so, you, you, now note that each of these Boltzmann machines, they will have their own set of weights, W1, W2, W3. So, you're going to train, uh, use uh, the parameter matrices W1, W2, W3 by successively training RBM1, RBM2, and RBM3 individually in your pre-training phase. Now, once you have performed this pre-training of your restricted Boltzmann machine using contrastive divergence, you can use it to initialize a conventional neural network. Now, this unfurling of this Boltzmann machine that I've shown on the right here is very similar to this unfurling which I showed in the slide over here. So again, all you are doing is that you are in a sense uh, inheriting these weights W1, W2, W3 from the Boltzmann machine, which you trained using contrastive div divergence. The difference is that now you're treating this as a conventional neural network. Now, all your activations, you're, re you're going to replace the sigmoid-based sampling with real-valued sigmoid activations. And all of these operations are conventional neural network operations which use real values. And then what you're going to do is that you're going to do fine tune with, with back propagation. So uh, you can see that the one on the right, the matrices have changed. So you, uh, so you can see uh, on the left, it's W1 transpose is W1 transpose plus E1. So all the matrices, they are fine tuned using back propagation. That's conventional back propagation because you can treat it as a conventional neural network. And typically this is much easier because the initialized, the, the way in which the RBM is trained, your initialized neural network already performs reasonably good re re reconstruction. So fine-tuning it is much easier than starting from scratch. You no longer have the vanishing and exploding gradient problems when you use this type of approach. Now, RBMs have also been used for a variety of other supervised and unsupervised applications. So it has been used for collaborative filtering. And in fact, uh, it was a component of the Netflix prize contest. And uh, it, it in fact gives quite different results from an autoencoder like architecture in an earlier lecture because the autoencoder like architecture was more like matrix factorization and the RBM results are very different from matrix factorization. And that is why it's very natural to use it as an ensemble approach because one gains more by uh, combining diverse kinds of models. And uh, uh, an RBM can be used for topic models and it can even be generated for classification. So even though RBMs are inherently unsupervised models, one can directly build supervised models with the use of RBM. So here I have given an example of how you can train RBMs uh, for collaborative filtering. Now here I have shown RBMs for two different users. Now, I'm assuming that uh, your hidden units, you, you, have, you, have, you have two hidden units. So that's uh, in matrix factorization parallels, this would correspond to a factorization dimensionality of two. So here you can have hidden units with dimension of two. In practice, of course, your hidden units will have a much larger dimensionality. But for the purpose of clarity, I've only shown two hidden units here. And you have five movies, E.T., Nixon, uh, Shrek, Gandhi, Nero. And but not all users have rated all movies. So the user on the left, 
has only rated ET and Shrek, and the user on the right has rated ET, Nixon, Gandhi, and Nero. So you are so you get two different Boltzmann machines for uh, these two users. The, an important point is the weights uh, in these two Boltzmann machines are shared. So for example, the ET to H1 weight will be the same in both the Boltzmann machine. The other difference from what we have seen, seen so far is that because the ratings can take on values from 1 to 5, uh, you don't use binary states, you use softmax activation. So you can see uh, only within ET I have 5 uh, states in there and only one of them is 1. So this is softmax activation. So there are some changes that you have to make to the uh, um, training algorithm to incorporate softmax activation instead of sigmoid activation and those changes are quite simple and the details of those uh, changes are discussed in the book. Uh, one can also use it for uh, to build topic models. So in topic models in a sense what you're going to do is that uh, the visible states will correspond to the tokens in the document. So you will have as many visible states as the number of tokens in the documents. So the visible states uh, will share, so each token in the document will share the uh, same set of parameters. But the hidden units will have different sets of parameters. <coughs> and again, the visible states take on softmax units. So typically, uh, the, the 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 size of softmax that means the number of possibilities of softmax is equal to the lexicon size. Now imagine a situation where you have a lexicon size of 100,000 and a document containing 20 words. So what's going to happen is that the number of softmax units is going to be equal to 20 because that's your document size. That includes repeated words. So you might have 20 words. Uh, so so you might you might really have 12 distinct words, but there, there'll be 20 words including repetitions. So then you'll have 20 of these softmax units, and the uh, each softmax will have, if, if your lexicon size is 100,000 or 200,000, it will have that many number of possibilities. And the weight from each visible unit, to, uh, fr uh, fr from different visible units to the same hidden unit is always the same. So the weight from H1 to every visible unit is always the same, but the weight from different hidden units is different. <coughs> and, and again, uh, one can modify the contrastive divergence algorithm to work with this kind of architecture and the details of the training are again discussed in the book. Now, uh, RBMs can be used for classification in more than one way. So the simplest possible way in which RBMs are, are used, are, they are used for unsupervised pre-training. We already showed how uh, RBMs can be used for pre-training of an autoencoder. Now, the pre-training of an autoencoder is not very different from the pre-training of a classifier. The only difference is in terms of the additional training of the final layer, pre-training of the final layer. In a sense, the RBM can learn the features in an unsupervised way uh, and, and in this case, the class label does not get any state in the RBM. Now, one can also treat a class label as a state. So, the, so in that case, the hidden features are connected to both the class variables and the feature variables. Now, if you just use a naive approach for doing this, the generative approach of the RBMs is not fully optimized for classification accuracy. So what you need is that you need to change the uh, objective function. So rather than the energy function, you need a discriminative objective function, which is called a discriminative Boltzmann machine in order to learn the classifier. So, so, so this is in a sense the classification architecture where you have these hidden states and then you have the visible states which are your features in your training data and then you have the multinomial visible states. So let's say you have three different classes. So you'll have a soft max here corresponding to three different classes and you have two sets of weights W and U. So now you can train it like a generative Boltzmann machine by minimizing an energy function but doing that will not give you very good uh, results because the kind of weights that are learned will not be optimized for maximizing classification accuracy. For, 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 for maximizing classification accuracy, you need to change the objective function and some discussion on this point is given in the book. So uh, to summarize some comments, RBMs uh, are in a sense a special case of probabilistic graphical models and they provide an alternative to the autoencoder. And even though I have not discussed it in this lecture, uh, they can be extended to 
non-binary data and some details of how they can be extended to non-binary data uh, are discussed in the book. Now, these models have significant historical significance because they started the idea of pretending. How in the modern era, they are not used as frequently anymore. 